John mentioned. My name is my name is Kyle Broderick. I am the plant and pest uh, diagnost. I coordinate the plant and pest diagnostic clinic. Um, I'm also an extension uh, an extension educator at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And I'll be honest, um, I don't get a whole lot of questions about fruit diseases. Um, so probably 70, 80 percent of the samples that come through the diagnostic clinic are are agro or are row crops. And so corn, soybeans, and wheat um, are, are really the big ones. But that other 30 percent that comes from comes from homeowners or the green uh, people within the green industry, those are the ones that are really exciting. And so, so I, I, I often enjoy kind of working with working with fruit trees and things like that. Um, so let's see, we'll try and yeah, and it's all right. So um, yeah, dormant season control of pests in different and various fruits. As I was thinking about this topic, you know, first thing I really thought about was what is, well, we always have to think about the plant health continuum, right? And so no different than you and I, the healthier a plant is, the better it will be able to fight off anything else. This, um, this is not only the case during, when, um, during the season when the trees are actively growing, but it's also the case during, during the dormant season as well. And so if we have trees that go into winter, go into the dormant season with a lot of stresses and they're not the healthiest trees, they're going to succumb to a lot of these, a lot of these winter or dormant season stresses um, more easily than, than their healthy counterparts would. So, so really we always wanna be thinking about, about the plant health continuum and really anything that we can do um, to modify the, the abiotic conditions or the environmental conditions of the, of the plant in question will greatly, um, will greatly increase the plant's ability to fight off any diseases, any insect pests that are going to come its way. So, and then just a, a quick primer, you know, stages of fruit tree development. There are a lot of stages. Um, you know, typically we think about disease control as occurring from green tip through fruit set. Um, you know, often, at least with, in my yard, I don't do a whole lot in the winter. I, one of the things I love about winter is that I can kind of stop doing my yard work and, and caring for, uh, caring for my, my food producing plants. But really, really that should not be done, especially with fruit trees. Um, and so, so I have, here we just have the different stages of fruit tree development. Again, dormancy is the main one that, that we are dealing with, with here. But a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of the effective disease management controls for for fruit trees will occur within that first um, that first portion of the season, um, really up until bloom. And so it's we have a lot of diseases that are best controlled with with an application at or before um, those petals are are open and and out. So. So dormancy, dormancy really is it's the the overwintering stage. Um, I, you know, I tend to think of everything like a fungus, um, and so it's what are the, how does it overwinter? Um, and it's, uh, I think of fungi. And so with trees, when they reach dormancy, that's kind of their their overwintering stage. And a lot of times people will think about dormancy being as the trees the trees are sleeping. That's not a hundred percent accurate. Yeah, they're they're resting, but something that I've seen that I, I like a little bit more is that instead of instead of sleeping, they're they're just chilling out and they're just waiting for the waiting for the environment to um, to get to where to get to where it's conducive for for good tree growth. But really, dormancy is any time from when the leaves drop in the fall until growth resumes in the spring, and during that time. The tree is relatively inactive, buds are relatively inactive as well. Now with dormancy, one thing we want to pay attention to is delayed dormancy. And so there will be different diseases and different pests that you may see are best controlled at delayed dormancy. 
And so this is, this is the period from when those buds start to swell. And so they, they're starting to, to get a little bit larger, but before that green tip period. Um, and, and again, so, so being out there, um, being actively, actively scouting and, and paying attention to the climactic conditions to see what are, what, uh, what growth stage or, um, yeah, basically what, what growth stage are, our plants are like will be very, very important. So that's dormancy in fruit trees. Dormancy in non or in non tree fruits is a lot, a lot easier. Um, you know, when we think about dormancy with, with brambles or with grapes, you know, John mentioned this already, but typically we're going to prune, we're going to do a lot of pruning um, during that dormant season to get rid of a lot of, um, to get rid of a lot of that material that, that may be, ha uh, may be harboring any, any diseases or pests. And typically, at least when we're talking about non-tree fruits, dormancy is defined as any time from that, that first kill frost in the fall until we have, have new plant growth in the spring that's occurring. So why, why do we even need to worry about controlling things during the dormant season? Again, like I said, it's myself and a lot of, a lot of home gardeners that, that I talk to, they really look forward to winter because winter is a chance to relax a little bit. You don't have to be as, as on the ball about scouting and removing those, that disease tissue, things like that. Um, but we do still get a, good of, a lot of very good control that occurs in the dormant season. And so one of the main reasons is that there are a lot of key um, pests, whether they are insects or diseases, that um, by the time we start to see them, we can't really control them a whole lot. And so one of the, one of the best examples for this is going to, be, it's going to be cedar apple rust. And so once we start to see those rust pustules occur on the, um, on your apple trees or your pear leaves, it's by far too late to, to do anything about it. You can spray all the fungicide in the world. It's going to do very little to actually, to actually control that disease. Um, and, there's, and that's the case with, with, a, lot of, with a lot of our diseases. Um, apple scab is another one um, where by the time we start to see, at, by the time we start to see those scab lesions showing up on the leaves, it's almost too late to too late to do a whole lot. Anthracnose is another great example. Um, once we start to see those anthracnose lesions on the leaves, it's really it's really too late to do anything. But there's also a lot of aside from the fact that we have a lot of a lot of insects and diseases that are hard to control once we see symptoms. There are some pretty large benefits to doing dormant season control too. And the biggest one, at least in my mind, is that we get so much better coverage. One of the, the most difficult things about um, doing disease control of, of trees or, or bushy plants, um, strawberries would even fall into the same, the same line, is we need to get very good coverage in order to control any of the diseases or pests that we're, that we're after. Most of our pesticides are, um, are contact pesticides. We, we do have some that are, that are systemic, so they will actually enter into the plant and will, um, and that chemical will move throughout the plant. But the vast majority of our, um, of our pesticides are, are contact in nature. So they actually have to, they actually have to hit the organism that's, um, that we're after in order to get that good control. And during the dormant season, we don't have any leaves. And leaves block a lot of, uh, they block a lot of pesticides from getting to the, to the trunk or elsewhere on the, elsewhere on the stem or on the branches. Some other benefits of it, um, you know, one of the really good things is our beneficials are le tend to be less active during the dormant season. And so we don't need to be as concerned about um, any, of, any of our pesticides having, um, having non-target effects to some of our beneficial insects or mites during that time. And, and finally, 
a lot of our insect pests tend to concentrate on twigs and shoots during the dormant season. Once they're on the twigs and the shoots, it's a lot easier to, to monitor them, a lot easier to scout and try to find them. And since they're on the, um, out on the twigs and shoots, it's also a lot easier to make sure that we are getting that, that good coverage um, in order to, to see the control that, that we're after. Oh, what did I just do? Okay. So as far as some diseases that and pests that are very well controlled um, through dormant season applications, have a lot of pictures here that are, um, I guess, to a pathologist. We these are kind of cool pictures. We we often like like seeing these things. To a to a homeowner, to an to someone who has an orchard, this is this is terrifying. And so, so a few of the things that, that we're looking at here, uh, let's see if I can. All right, so kind of drawing a circle around this first one here, that's fire blight on a fire blight on, on an apple tree. Um, typically we'll see, we tend to think of fire blight as causing some uh, really jet black lesions and the leaves may turn black as well. That, that doesn't always occur with those. Um, right here. All right. This really cool, kind of very reddish, very deformed leaf. Um, this is, Again. This is due to um, this is this is peach leaf curl, and so that's caused by a um, caused by a fungal pathogen to Phryna. But again, this is another one of those those fungal pathogens that once we see symptoms, it's not going to do a whole lot. Other things that we're looking at um, on this slide, you know, right here, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen these these kind of soft. Um, fairly large insects moving around, moving around their plants. Those are mealybugs. Um, some other examples we have, we, uh, brown rot um, right here on apricots. And then here we have bitter rot on apples. Uh, this bitter rot is also caused by the same, the same pathogen that causes anthracnose on the leaves, also causes bitter rot on, on apples to occur. And the final one that I wanted to, wanted to show here are we have some more pears that we're looking at. They're very spotty. You're going to have a hard time a hard time selling those. These are um, these are pears that are affected by scale, and I'm pretty sure this was San Jose scale, but I'm not not a hundred percent not a hundred percent on that one. So. Again, I kind of already talked about this, but some of the some of the main pests, that, the insect pests that we think about controlling during dur during dormancy. A lot of our scale insects are 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 well controlled during during this time. Um, certain mites can be very well controlled. Mealybugs, um, it, um, we're able to control the immature stages, and also aphids. We tend to see pretty good control of aphids during um, during the dormant season as well. And even though a lot, a lot of these insects may not be active, some of the different products that we can use during, um, for our dormant season applications are able to penetrate the eggs or able to penetrate those overwintering structures that the insects have in order to, in order to, in order to cause the, um, in order to get the control that, that we're really after. Again, some of the pathogens, the main, the main pathogens that I think about controlling during, during the growing season, um, again, fire blight, is, or during the dormant season, I apologize. Fire blight is, is a big one. Um, of all of the fruit questions that I get, fire blight is by far number one. Um, but again, some of our, leaf, our leaf curls are very well controlled um, through dormant season um, sprays. Brown rot, um, and also canker management. Is, um, is best done during the, during the dormant season as well. Again, when, we're not, when those leaves aren't on the, on the, 
when the leaves aren't on the tree, we're able to see a lot more and we can identify these things quite a bit better. And some of the other pathogens that I tend to think about as being well controlled during the dormant season, but other people may, may, may kind of disagree with this, is a lot of our foliar leaf spots. And so a lot of our foliar leaf spots, they overwinter on the, um, on the leaf tish, on, the, on the leaves that have fallen on the ground. And if we are able to manage that, fol that fallen foliage, that can reduce the inoculum for a lot of our foliar leaf spots. Now, some of the effective dormant season controls, I tend to think of record keeping as being one of the best things that you can do during the, during the dormant season. Um, we typically have a longer window for, for treatment periods during the dormant season. There's not as much going on. So making sure that all of our records are really up to date um, can save us a lot of time in the long run. And we have sanitation and, and chemical controls as well that can be used. But you know, when thinking about record keeping, I recommend that people keep a journal of really all activities that are done in their, in their garden, in their orchard, in their landscape. Um, and those activities can be what, what plants do we have out there? What, what sort of management um, procedures have we used? Um, so using having plant maps, so we are able to identify that we know and we know in the southeast corner of the, of the orchard, we routinely have lower yield. Well, now we can target that southeast corner. Um, the other good thing about having uh, well well composed plant maps is you can document the resistant packages that the different plants have. And so whenever we think about management, whether it is for insects, diseases, or some of our environmental factors, using host resistance is always going to be our cheapest and most effective option. Having a good plant map really tells us, all right, we know that these trees over here, these are resistant to, to fire blight. Know that these strawberries over here are resistant to phomopsis. Um, but we also want to be keeping track of uh, which different, which what the different pesticides are. And so not only um, the the exact pesticide isn't as important as keeping track of your active ingredients. And so making sure that we are rotating um, rotating our active ingredients so that we're not not selecting for resistance to occur is, is very important. The other thing is when we do kind of that year end approach to looking at, at management, we can look at the where we applied pesticides and ask, did we get good control? If the answer is yes, then all right, we can probably keep on going. If you did not get good control, then you wanna go back to the drawing board and maybe try to try to rethink your pesticide strategy. Maybe it's a different active ingredient that you wanna use. Maybe you're trying to control for a disease that's not there. A lot of diseases um, can look very similar and it's very easy to misidentify them. And the other thing with our, um, as we're thinking about uh, some of this record keeping, I tend to think about replacement plants in that, in that, same, that same portion too. So, you know, a lot of times, sometimes plants have just outlived their usefulness. Um, you know, I, I wish that I could say that the apple, the, the, apple, or the apple trees that I have in my yard that are 30 years old will live for another 30 years and be productive for 30, 30 years. The truth of the matter is they, they won't. Um, those trees are, they're already near the end of their life, near the end of their life cycle. So basically it's going to, uh, it's time to, instead of trying to manage any of the diseases that are currently on those trees, it's really time to start thinking about a replacement in their, um, in their place. And as we are thinking about replacement plants, again, using genetic resistance is always going to be the best thing that you can do. Um, another, thing, another thing to consider, especially with trees, is to look for some of those dwarf or semi-dwarf varieties if they're available. When we have, the smaller the plant is, the easier it is to control pretty much everything. You know, we're able to, um, if we have a 30-foot tree, 
it's very unlikely that you can go out there and apply a pesticide to that tree effectively yourself. If you have a 10 foot tall tree, there's a pretty good chance that you can get a good, um, good, uh, good pesticide control um, by yourself without having to hire it out. And moving on, um, so sanitation. I talk so much about sanitation in the, in the diagnostic clinic. Um, cleaning, most of our diseases, most of our pests, and they live on that, they live on that over, um, they live on that, they live in that dead and diseased tissue. And so getting rid of that tissue is very, very important. But sanitation should not only occur during the dormant season. Really, I always think about sanitation starting kind of towards the end of the, towards the last half of the season. And what are the leaves, what are the leaves, what are the branches doing? Do we see any, do we see any leaves or any branches that are flagging? Maybe they're turning yellow. Um, the leaves are starting to turn, to turn and dropping a little bit sooner than, than, the, than their neighboring branches. That's a good sign that there is some sort of injury, maybe a canker or something like that that's causing, causing that injury. Another thing to be on the lookout for is fire blight. Um, and again, I've got a, another picture of the image that we have right here. Those, we have that nice characteristic kind of dark shepherd's crook um, that's occurring on those, on those branches that may not be as noticeable once the, um, during the dormant season. And so keeping track of where we're seeing that um, those flagging branches, those injured branches occurring, makes our, makes our job during the dormant season much, much easier. We also wanna be out there collecting mummies. And that's the, the image that I have here on the right side. Um, it's some more, again, more brown rot, but brown rot and a scab does the same thing. But those diseases, one of the things that they do is they tend to make the diseased fruit stick to the plant. And so unfortunately, the um, in here, all of this kind of fuzzy growth that we're seeing right there, those are fungal spores. And those spores will remain on, remain on, the, um, remain on the tree throughout the dormant season. And then next spring, once, leave, um, once the tree is starting to leaf out, those spores become active and can cause reinfection. And so making sure that we are removing those mummies throughout the growing season greatly reduces our inoculum for, um, for the upcoming year. And finally, foliage management. Again, the, the leaves that drop harbor a lot of different diseases. Um, and so whether that's going to be collecting them and removing them, or, or even just mowing the leaves and shredding them. Um, once we, when leaves are shredded, they're a lot smaller, they tend to break down much more quickly. Another thing that you can do, if you have severe issues with some of our, some of our foliar leaf spots, you can apply urea um, to the ground once the leaves have dropped, and then go through and shred the leaves, maybe just with a mower, but the urea application plus shredding greatly increases the rate at which those leaves decompose. If we don't have leaves there for the fungus to, or for the disease to live on, it's not, it's going to be much harder for that, that disease to cause infection next year. Again, then with our, with our non-trees, you know, I tend to think about sanitation as being being relatively easy, whether it's whether it's brambles, maybe it's something like strawberries. You know, grapes are kind of in a in a weird a weird middle zone there. But the big thing is making sure that you are removing that dead tissue um, after harvest, and and then pruning the canes as well. And John kind of John kind of mentioned on this, and we'll spend more time on it later with our bramble specific um, programming, but. How we prune these canes after harvest is heavily dependent on the specific variety of plant that we have. If it's a if it's a prima uh, a prima cane plant, that would be different than than how than what we would than the pruning we would do is different than what we would do for some of our 
uh, some of our brambles that um, produce fruit in the spring. Now, cankers. Um, get a lot of a lot of questions about cankers, and you know what what are cankers? One of the nice things about most of our cankers is it really doesn't matter what pathogen is causing that canker. It doesn't matter if it's a um, if it's anthracnose. It typically doesn't matter if it's Botrysferia, if it's Phomopsis, um, if it's Nectria. And most of our canker control is going to be the same regardless of what the specific um, pathogen is that's causing that canker. But really, all that a, all a canker is is a localized area of disease that's occurring in the bark. Typically, we think about cankers occurring on the branches, but we can also have cankers that occur on the, on the main trunk. One of the worst things that happens is when you get cankers that are occurring um, kind of low, low down on that main trunk, not a whole lot to do. And so most of our cankers, how we, ident how we can identify them, you know, I talked about look, being observant earlier in the growing season. And so towards the end, or kind of early, in early fall, as you're seeing some of those branches that are beginning to flag, those leaves are turning earlier, earlier, maybe the leaves are dropping earlier, go back to those branches and look for some sort of canker. Typically there's going to be maybe just a roughened area of bark. Uh, maybe the bark is split a little bit. Um, it may be a little bit sunken. Typically it will be darker um, than, than the rest of the bark. Maybe you'll even see some, um, some oozing that's coming out of it. That's very common with, um, with fire blight that we get. Unfortunately, we also have some cankers that are next to, um, they're almost invisible from the outside. And unless we actually go back to those branches and start peeling back some of the bark and looking for the discoloration of the, of the sapwood, we can miss some of those cankers. But um, otherwise, good spots on your on your plants to to look for cankers. Really, anywhere that, where there is a, a wounding potential. And so, a lot of our canker pathogens are very opportunistic. They're they're fairly weak on their own, and so they're going to wait for for something else to open the plant up so that they can cause infection. And so, looking near wounds, um, pruning cuts, or branch uh, branch stubs, a very good way to very good way to kind of spot some of our cankers. And the best way to control our cankers is through pruning. Um, again, John spent a lot of time, a lot of time talking about pruning, so I'm not going to, not going to rehash it a whole lot. But with, when pruning for disease control, this is different than pruning for overall plant health, but when pruning for disease control, we want to make sure that we're cutting far enough back that we are have a good chance uh, to completely remove whatever pathogen is in is in the branch. The image that I have here, um, this is a, another apple tree with fire blight, and we have the large um, kind of black and discolored area. That's the actual canker. Where you want to cut is at least six to eight inches below that canker, because again, whatever bacteria, whatever fungus is causing that canker has moved through the branch further than we can see. And so cutting off that extra, those extra portions just um, greatly increases our chance of, of removing the pathogen completely. We also want to make sure that we're trying that we're pruning when the weather is dry. Um, pruning in kind of in wet weather is really not a good idea. Most of our pathogens require extended periods of free moisture in order to cause infection. And so for pruning during dry periods, we, have, we can greatly reduce the chance that some other pathogen can move in and take advantage of that open wound. The other thing is, that's very important, is sanitizing tools between plants, making sure that, we're, that we are not spreading that fire blight pathogen from tree to tree just through our canker, um, through our canker management. And chemical control is another, another great option. Um, you know, we think about, there's a lot of, a lot of copper sprays, a lot of or kind of organic um, chemical controls that can be used during the dormant season. For diseases, 
we tend to think of them being either a copper-based spray or a, or a sulfur-based spray. Um, additionally, chlorothalonil, um, which, is an, which is a inorganic fungicide, um, but chlorothalonil works very well um, for a lot of our dormant season sprays as also. On the entomological side, so our insect pests, a lot of our, um, our horticultural oils work very well. And also some of our extract oils, such as, such as neem oils, um, can work very well for chemical control. But it doesn't matter if we're using chemical control during the middle of the growing season or you know, in the middle of February, we must pay attention to that label. And so what is on that pesticide label is the law. And it's also going to give us all of the information that we should need to have an effective pesticide application. One of the biggest things um, that we need to pay attention to during the, um, during the off season, during the dormant season, are the, are the specific temperature requirements needed for different, different pesticides. A lot of our pesticides don't work very well in freezing temperatures. And so and the reason for that is a, many, a lot of our pesticides are mixed with water. Once temperatures drop, drop below freezing, the pesticide and the water tend to separate. And so we have much less, much less control, um, much less control that occurs. So really a, a lot of our um, dormant season chemical control is best during you know, when we have temperatures between 40 and 50 degrees, that's, that tends to be ideal. Um, another thing that's, that's important is, if possible, do not use the same sprayer and tank for weed control that you use for disease or insect control. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying that you don't know how to clean out a sprayer, um, but I have seen a lot of injury that's occurred from sprayers that have not been cleaned out properly. And there's a little bit of glyphosate left in the, left in the hose or, or another herbicide that's left in the tank. And now we're seeing a lot of off-target effects too. Um, typically during, uh, during the dormant season, we will spray until we see runoff. And so um, spraying, those, spraying those trees, spraying those, those plants, until we're able to see droplets literally running down the um, running down the um, the twigs or the trunk. The other nice thing is is since there's not a whole lot of green tissue present, we can do some things that would maybe be a little bit uh, or that would be more likely to cause phytotoxicity during the growing season. Biggest one of those is mixing of horticultural oils and copper. Now that's a very big no-no during the during the growing season, because we can see a lot of a lot of phytotoxicity that occurs when oils when our horticultural oils and copper products are applied at the same time. During the dormant season, we don't have that green tissue, so we don't see those phytotoxicity issues occurring. And finally, even though it is winter, your protective, your personal protective equipment is still necessary. So making sure that we have on a good pair of boots, um, long pants, a good pair of gloves, um, making sure that we're applying these pesticides safely is still going to be important, whether it's dormant season control or in season control. I mentioned some of our some of our oils. Um, these oils work very well to control a lot of our insect pests um, that overwinter on either the branches or the trunks. And the way that the the way that they work is they tend to smother the adults. And so if we have adults that are adults that are active, as um, in the case as is the case with scale, these dormant oils actually really just smother them when it's. Uh, when we're looking to control an, an insect pest um, in the egg or the larval stage, a lot of these oils are, are formulated to soak into those eggs and they can kind of smother them from the inside then too. And again, I did mention that these are, that these are temp temperature sensitive. If you try to apply any, any oils really beneath 40 degrees, your control is not going to be is probably not going to be as effective as, as you would like. 
Um, and a few of the diseases um, you think about controlling, again, I mentioned fire blight. Here we have um, some of the very characteristic fire blight cankers that we'd want to be on, we, that we'd want to be looking out for. Now, an important thing to think about with fire blight is this bacteria overwinters inside of the tree. It doesn't overwinter on the outside. So it doesn't matter what we spray on the, what we spray on the, um, on the tree during the dormant season. It, there's a, it's very unlikely that whatever product, what, if it's a copper product or if it's a, or if it's a, um, an actual um, inorganic um, antibiotic, it's very unlikely that that pesticide will penetrate the will penetrate the, the tree and and kill the and kill the bacteria. And so that's why I'm um, cutting out these cankers that are typically very black, as I mentioned, is the best thing that we can do to control fire blight. But then using a having a copper application during that delayed dormancy period is very very effective with fire blight. The fire blight pathogen, it infects through wounds, but it also inflect, infects through the flowers and actively growing leaf tips. If we're able to do a copper application in that delayed dormancy period as the, um, as the buds are beginning to swell, but before, before those leaves have, have, um, have emerged, we do see pretty good, good control for, for fire blight. Some other ones, uh, brown spot and apple scab. You know, these are two two very different diseases. Uh, brown spot, or I'm sorry, brown rot uh, is caused by the mon uh, mononilla fungus, and apple scab is caused by a fungus in the, uh, the in the Venturia genus. But both of these both of these fungal pathogens, once they've infected the fruit, that infected fruit tends to stick to the plant. And so it doesn't drop at the end of the season as, as one would hope. And then what happens is those, those infected fruit that are become mummies, um, that's, they are loaded with inoculum to cause reinfection during the, during the next year. So again, the best ways to control a lot of these will be again, pruning as needed um, to control the tip light phase of, of brown rot especially. But then also when we're pruning, making sure that we are trying to remove as much of that mummified, as much of that mummified fruit as we can. Also, removal of any infected foliage um, will be will be very, very beneficial. And another uh, group, another group of diseases that are well controlled with our dormant season applications will be at, uh, our leaf curl diseases. And all, all, all of our leaf curl diseases um, are within the Tephrina genus. Um, and so here we have a picture of peach leaf curl, but we have, we have a lot, there are a lot of other plants can get, um, be infected with different, different Tephrina fungi to cause very similar symptoms. And one of the things with leaf curls is that repeated infections can cause fairly severe tree decline over time. Luckily, in Nebraska, our environment is not is not the most conducive to, um, to a lot of our leaf curls. But as we're seeing much more of kind of a of, of roller coaster weather events where we have really warm and it cools down and it gets warm again and gets cold again and it gets warm and cools down again. When we have weather conditions like that, Tephrina becomes much more active. So we do have potential to, to see more, more tephrina in the future. Um, but again, this disease, once we are actually seeing these blisters occurring on the leaf, treatment will be ineffective. And so really, really nothing is, nothing is, going, to, nothing is going to happen. When the leaves drop, you can, you can rake up all those leaves, you can destroy all the leaves. But again, we still won't get good control with, with tephrina. So if this is something that you've um, dealt with historically, really thinking about a, a preventative fungicide in late November, early December, and then also a second application just before the, um, the buds are, begin to swell works very well con to control this, um, this fungal disease. 
two main products that, would, that we would recommend for to control our, our leaf curls would be chlorothalonil, but also Bordeaux's mixture works, works very well too. And you know, finally, um, I really can't talk about managing, managing fruits, uh, fruit diseases without mentioning the Midwest Fruit, um, fruit Pest Management Guide. And so this is a this is a document that's produced by um, plant health specialists across the across the region. Um, they update it. I think they update it annually, but every every once in a while they they may go a year. They may go a year without updating it. But this is a a great resource if you are growing fruit in your in your landscape. And I do have the, um, I do have the web address um, underneath the image there, but this fruit guide is, um, it has, it has spray schedules in it. So it has spray schedules for different plants. And so it has spray schedules for apples, for, for peaches, for plums, basically you name it, it has, will give you a spray schedule in there. Another good thing is it, it also talks a lot about um, sprayer calibration. And so as we're thinking about any of our dormant season pesticide controls, we wanna make sure that, that things are properly calibrated, that we're, that we're applying the, the correct dosage. And we, uh, there's a lot, of good, um, a lot of good information about calibration within that guide too. And you know, finally, if you are uncertain about your diagnoses, help is available. And so I am a member uh, or the, the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic at UNL is a member of the National Plant Diagnostic Network. Um, this was a network that was um, constructed in the, um, in the wake of 9-11, basically to, pre um, to try to decrease the likelihood of a bioterrorism event occurring. But in every state across the country, there is at least one NPDN affiliated lab. And so if you're within Nebraska, you know, I would love for you to send your samples to me. I said, if you're outside of Nebraska, there are, um, there are local, local laboratories that, that you can use as well. 